Okay, so we can get started. Okay, so hello everyone. I have here today a very special guest with me, virtually of course, is Sergio Ortega, a Pacoima born and raised Latino from Mexican parents, an immigrant, a coach, and a motivational speaker. Sergio, you are a person who like many has been successful and even accomplished many of your goals through adversity as well. You have shown to beat the odds by becoming the man that you always wanted to become. You have been motivated by your parents and you have the desire to continue being a better person. Now, you are one that inspires and motivates. So Sergio, I am curious to know about mindfulness being one of your projects. Tell me a little bit more about mindfulness. What is it about? For sure. So I've been teaching in general over 15 years and here in Napa over eight years. And about six years ago, I started teaching my students mindfulness, breathing techniques, calming exercises, and things that I felt that eventually they're gonna need in the future. And something that we didn't get taught as kids. So I thought, you know what, let's start planting the seed early this time so we don't have to get it at later in life. So <clears throat> with that being said, I realized that adults also need to learn how to breathe, how to calm, how to relax, how not to stress, coping skills, de-escalating skills, so then I gathered some information that I read with kids and I figured out I can use this same method with adults and just change up a few of the verbatim skills and change up a few of the, the, the vibes that we kind of come across each other as adults versus kids. Because kids, it's like little, you know, kid friendly, making it fun, adventurous. But adults, it's really zoning in on your um, abilities to not focus on the stressful situations in life, which is not easy because there's many. But that's the challenge, and that's the gift that mindfulness brings to us is being able to distinguish stress versus uh, something that we can just let go and let it go because we hold on to a lot of stress throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the year, and it's just not good for us. It's just not good trauma to revert back to at any point in time. So that's why mindfulness came out. I live in Napa, wine, mindfulness, it was all like linked together, and sure enough, it's, it's starting to run already. So this is where you're currently located in Napa Valley, right? The one yeah, for the last eight years, I went from LA, San Fernando Valley, and I came straight to Napa Valley. Um, I don't know how that happened, but I'm here, I've been here, and I'm not saying I don't, I'm not looking back and I don't wanna go back home, but I miss my family, I miss my friends, I miss my origins, I miss my land of, you know, Pacoima, San Fernando, but my son's at a dual immersion school here. I'm teaching. I'm starting this mindfulness project. I just joined CY Unity, which is a new app coming out in Napa, like an, an app for Napa, which is perfect up my alley as far as community-based things, kids, the seniors, mental awareness. So a lot is brewing right now in my, on my plate, and I have a lot on my plate, but I'm hungry. So that's a good thing. <laughs> so you're talking about hunger. When did it occur to you that you wanted to build up mindfulness? Two years ago in a conversation, the word mindfulness came up and I never looked it up, never investigated it. Just, I was like, that's a cool word. And they just put it in here. I was like, I'm going to keep that. And then two years later, um, I look it up online and the UK, Italy, and France, mindfulness already exists. Mindfulness is already a thing over there, but they do more meditative wine tasting, more virtual meditative wine tastings. I'm not about the wine tasting component, which I don't mind, but I don't have my fingers in that yet. I'm more about the mind, but I thought I'd use the wine because we're here in Napa and there's over 400 wineries and it's like easy to connect the two because they kind of go hand in hand. That's great. I like that. So what do you hope your clients gain out of mindfulness? You kind of spoke a little bit about that, but what is your goal? Yeah, my, my goal is to learn breathing techniques, learn calming exercises, learn coping skills, things that we were never taught as kids. We were busy hit, being hit with the chancla or the bell or scolded or sent to the corner and we were crying. We were hyperventilating. We were, you know, wishing, you know, bad things on our parents when we got spanked. But we were never taught how to sit, breathe, calm, count to 10, in through your nose, out through your mouth, take your mind to a distant land and go to your happy place. Like those things were never taught to us. So I figured, you know what, if I can teach kids this, which I've taught over a thousand in Napa and I feel very proud about that but I want to teach adults now too. So I even tell my students, who do you think can learn from this? My mom, my dad, my aunt, I go, go teach them. So they're my little teachers. I send them home to go teach their parents how to breathe. And it's pretty, pretty amazing. She speak about the whole chancla and getting in trouble, which brings me flashbacks. 
It's true. I mean, it disciplined us. And to be honest with you, it got us to this point where we're not in jail. We're not on the streets. We're not doing drugs. We're not in gangs because a little bit of the discipline goes a long way. And I'm not for like, let's keep beating our kids. But if they need a little chancla, a little spanking in the behind, sometimes it gets their attention for them not to do it again, like touching a hot stove. And they're like, oh, maybe I won't do that again, just because that didn't feel too well. So I'm not a strong believer because I try to cut the umbilical cord there and not, you know, do that to my son. But I do let him know that, you know what, sometimes I got this treatment and I don't want you to get this treatment, but do something better so you don't have to go through that route. And he's get, he gets it. He's 10 years old. So I, I'm just happy that he gets it and I'm not having to use those old methods of, of, of rearing or spanking, but just very, very talking, using mindful techniques. I teach him how to breathe in through his nose and out through his mouth, use I am affirmations, and it helps him to calm down and to breathe and relax instead of being anxious and overstressed and just high energy. So you're talking right now about the, this positive effect that it's having on your son. What positive effects have you noticed that it's had on people, like your clients? I mainly worked with students so far because the whole mindfulness is brand new to me, but I did do a 60 parent migrant ed, like, like a TED talk, but it was a mindfulness talk and it was impactful, empowering, um, emotional. There was a lot of, lot of emotions flying in that room that day because people had never experienced mindfulness. They had never witnessed mindfulness. They had never practiced mindfulness. So when I had my migrant ed parents in there, I'm really like honing in on focusing on their minds to say, you know what, at any point in time, you could turn it off, you can breathe, you can calm, you can relax, and just take a break for a few minutes here and there. And they got the message. They were like nodding yes, and like, yeah, you make sense. And you. I, I get it, but it was weird that it took that long for them to get that message. And the people that I do hear getting mindfulness throughout life after NA, after AA, after detention centers, after being in jail, that's where they learn mindfulness. So I'm like, that's a little backwards. Let's fix that so they know mindfulness and maybe they don't have to do those things and get in trouble and then need it then. So I'm hoping to just keep doing that with my students and adults. But as far as the adults, just the other day I was at Ross and this man goes, hey, do you still do those talks? And I literally, I have my mask on. I like this, all you can see is my eyes. And this guy Alberto's like, hey, are you still doing those talks? And I'm like, what talks? You know what I mean? I was like totally confused because I haven't done it like in a, over a year and a half. And because I did two, two talks back to back years and he went to both of them. So he was like, I was in those talks that you did. And I'm like, whoa, like that's pretty amazing that he saw just my eyeballs. And he, able, he was able to identify me and tell me, you, are you still doing those talks? Like, I guess it was pretty empowering for him to even just ask me and say, do I still do them? Maybe he was inquiring. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll keep you posted if I do another one. But it was just, it was pretty, 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 I don't know, just kind of like out of the blues. But it, it made me feel good too, you know, to see that somebody's still thinking about that moment. And hopefully they're still using those mindful practices. That's showing the impact that you, you've had upon him. Yeah. And, you know, why do you think personally, you know, you mentioned how mindfulness is something that's done in other countries. And why do you think that it should be done, you know, in other cities and other countries? Yeah, and not even mindfulness, just mindfulness. But mindfulness is just something because it's like cute and, and attaches to the wine. And I live in wine country. But mindfulness in general, it's just... I think it should be a mandated thing. I should. I think it should be started in pre-K, kindergarten, just simple breathing techniques. I have, I'll have. i send you footage of my students in, in kindergarten that I just started working with two weeks ago. And I've already taught them mindfulness. I've already taught them how to cool down, sit, breathe, close their eyes, go into their happy place, and they're doing it. And this is only five-year-old kids. So if a five-year-old kid can get it that has all this energy, I think an adult that can learn how to distinguish time from work, school, play, kids. Oh, I need mindful time for five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, whatever it may be. Some people need five. Some people need an hour. Use it. Do it. And it just needs to, it needs to be taught. It's a seed. It's a tool. It's a method. Um, but it's not really focused on it. And, and I'm trying to break that, uh, um, you know, break that cycle of not focus on it. Let's focus on it. I see your, your passion, the way you speak about mindfulness and mindfulness, and it just, I'm curious to know who was and who continues to be your motivation and your inspiration, inspiration behind this whole becoming a coach. Um, just being, I didn't have a younger brother or sister as a kid. 
as an adult, um, you know, growing up. And that was always what I was seeking. I always wanted to teach somebody younger than me. I had six, eight and 10 year older brothers than me and they were too busy doing their thing. So I was left alone to figure it out, but I didn't have somebody to teach. I didn't have somebody to, to, to look at me and be like, look at, I'm your role model, look at me, look at me. Then my nephews and nieces were born. I had just graduated college um, and it was a Chicano Latino graduation committee. And I looked down at my eight nephews and nieces, seven, and they were like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years old. And I'm like, you're the next person that's gonna be on stage. You're gonna graduate next from college. And they were little kids. Three of them have already graduated from college, the first three of my nephews and nieces. And the other four are like in high school or in, in college still, but they're on their way. And two of them are at CSUN. And, uh, and it's just that is my motivation, my family, my heritage. I had two cousin, girl cousins that graduated from college in my family. And then I was the first boy male and I was the first person in my family. So it was pretty, pretty amazing to do saying like I had three older brothers and none of them graduated from college. And then I had a wide variety of cousins and only two graduated and they were sisters. So I took it upon myself to say, I'm going to be that third one or I'm going to be that first male to have a little diversity and say, oh, he did it. She did it. We can do it. So that's my motivation is my family, my friends, you know, things like that. My son, I have a 10 year old. So him seeing me do these things, he's like, wow, like you have mind control over these people. I was like, no, I'm just teaching them a method. And then they get it. And then and he gets it too. Cause I've been teaching him since he was before five years old, how to breathe, how to calm, how to, you know, do I am affirmations just to say, I am great. I am loving. I am kind versus I'm ugly. My hair's dumb. I don't like my face. I don't like my teeth. I don't like my hair. I am affirmation is just the way to go because we're just constantly reminding ourselves I am great through breathing. I am calm. I am happy. I am unique. So I advise everybody to write 10 I am affirmations and just read them every day, every morning, every night. Anytime you feel stress, remind yourself those I am affirmations. So that's really big for me too. I, I teach that and I have my kids and adults, I have them write their own 10 so that they can always revert back to them. You know? you know, anxiety is something that's constantly increasing right now. And I think it's something that children don't really know how to handle well. Uh, back nor, then. Adults. <laughs> nor adults. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and seeing how, you know, you're, you're working with them and you're helping them, teaching them, them all these things. But moving forward, you know, as you know, 2020 continues to surprise us and being in quarantine, the impact that this pandemic has brought upon all of us. I am curious to know how this pandemic has affected the way you are teaching. Well, through mindfulness and in general, I created a quarantine mindfulness, right? When we went into quarantine in my mindfulness.org site, I have a quarantine mindfulness to just teach people that they can read this little script that I wrote turn on some classical music, lay back, sit down, sit tall, breathe in, kind of just coaching them like six, seven little, um, just little pointers that they can use, that they can help anxiety, that they can help stress, that they can help going through these times. If I'm not there to teach them, log in and read it and learn it and then hopefully show somebody else and share it and teach somebody else. So this pandemic has heightened mindfulness because we're mindful of our mask. We're mindful of our distance. We're mindful of everything nowadays. And it's something that I want to make sure that we are focusing on because it's going to be something we're going to need for the rest of our lives, not just today. So did you have any original plans that were already made that were possibly affected? Did, did I have what? I'm sorry. Any, um, any original plans that were affected? No, um, because when I started launching mindful, uh, mindfulness, it was in January. And then COVID hit in March. So I was already promoting it, pushing the agenda, handing out my cards to people. But then COVID hit, so everybody had to stop life. But then it, it just was like a, um, a blessing in disguise because now everybody needs it. Everybody's looking for it. Everybody's seeking some type of mindful journey, some type of mindful awareness, some type of mental um, stimulation to help ease the stress, to help calm, to help bring back some clarity some balance and that's that's what i'm about so if they say if you're living in the past you're focused on depression you're, you're depressed and if you're living in the future you're anxious 
So I don't want to be too depressed nor anxious. I want to be right in the middle, a little bit of balance of both. And I'm not trying to think too far in front, but I'm not trying to think too far behind. And if I do, I want to look at the happy thoughts, not, oh, I was you know, trauma at six years old. No, like, got to let those things go because that will let, stay with us for the rest of our lives if we let it. So that's another like message to people. It's like, we got to let those things go. Well, I'm just amazed, you know, the way that you, you mentioned this, you know, looking into the past, I think that's something that a lot of people tend to do. They're like, oh, it's easy to say, let go of the past, forget of the past and move on. But I'm sure there are certain things, you know, that we keep in mind. But like you mentioned, you know, remembering the positive and looking into the future, thinking about the positive things that we hope that will happen. But we're, we're talking about quarantine right now and seeing the effect that it has on on us and seeing the way mental health has increased in both children and adults and we're, we're speaking about how you're teaching both adults and children and the way that you're now doing this quarantine mindfulness and mindfulness is there um something that you're doing that involves both parents and children to work together um when i teach my students uh, um, like in school I challenge them to go home and teach their parents. But I also have access to their parents that hopefully when we get back into school and distant, you know, being able to be around each other and distant, I want to be able to have a parent um, educated forum that we can go and talk, we can be mindful, we can share ideas, we can be there as far as like a, a listening ear or some advice. Um, so I'm already kind of planning that with my staff and saying, how can we get the parents involved? And not have the parents and the kids together, but I'm already teaching the kids. And the kids also learn mindfulness with their music teacher. So they're getting two different varieties of mindfulness. And now I'm trying to get these parents to kind of be on the same realm so that they can kind of make that connection. But right now, I don't want to, if I put them both in the same room, these kids know it, these parents don't. So it's going to be a little bit of off balance. So I need to teach these parents and I already taught these kids and then they can meet in the middle and they can help teach each other at home. So that's my bigger goal in life is for families to start doing it together. The kids know and the parents know the parents are not teaching the kids or vice versa. They both already know they can just in sync, get into it, put the music on and kind of like, oh, classical music. Oh, we're breathing. We're sitting tall and just start doing it by monkey see monkey do type of method versus yeah. like mom sit down i'm going to explain this i wanted you to do this or daughter sit down i want you to do this then it's like no, i don't want to do this you know, they get rebellious so it's a matter of just being able to do it knowing how to do it and then sharing that information so when you build up mindfulness your focus is adults there right yes so do you plan to include like a kid-friendly zone where it'll be like grape juice maybe <laughs> um a little great box um <clears throat> no it's the mindfulness is for the kids you know that's that's my method it's mindfulness and, and I'm, I'm like i'm starting to promote things like be mindful for students and be mindful for adults you know so they can distinguish the two different things <laughs> and they know it's two different you know characteristics and traits but um the be mindful method is like we have i have two students here in, in napa that created um the be kind movement so they have this red sticker, be kind in the middle, and they're like pushing their agenda everywhere. Now people have be kind stickers everywhere and be kind posters everywhere. So I'm trying to do the same thing, kind of piggyback off of that with the be mindful method, with the be mindful method for, you know, the wine industry, the restaurant industry, but for the kid industry at parks and, and, and you know, gyms and, and dance studios, be mindful everywhere. Because then that just helps you remind you to be mindful of your scenario. And the word being mindful just means enjoying your surroundings and being aware of where you're at. So that's pretty simple. Now you add mindfulness, enjoying your surroundings and being aware where you're at with wine in hand. <laughs> so it's like the same thing, but just a little bit extra. So we're talking about children right now. How do you see the newer generations benefiting from mindfulness? Seeing how, you know, social media is seeing to increase. And social media brings a lot of negative people and, you know, negative comments within. What do you think? Um, well, in my practice with my kids, I teach them in through one ear, out through the other method. You know, we learned that a long time ago, but we really didn't practice that even as adults. And if we did it as adults, we wouldn't let things get to us as much. So that method is huge. I'm always like, you know, in through, like, sometimes I tell them, you know how you hear me? It's like, you can hear me, but you're not listening to me. Okay, okay, listening, you process, you let it sit in there, you let it sink in. 
hearing, you let it go in through one ear, out through the other, and not let it register. So that part is something that I'm really focusing on the kids with, is like teaching them methods and teaching them tools to have when anxiety hits. Once I feel anxiety, once I feel stress, I'm gonna stop and breathe three times. And if it's a lot of stress, I'm gonna stop and breathe five times. And if it's a grand of stress, I'm gonna breathe for a minute. So it's a matter of how much stress it is and how many breaths can attach to that stress and knock it out. Um, so what I said the other day, I want to make a shirt that says, um, the more stress, the more stress, the more breaths, something like that. You know what I mean? Like something yeah. catchy, but simple, but like where I can read it, the more stress, oh, the more breaths. Hmm. Okay. That means take deep breaths if I feel stressed. Yeah. Kind of make that connection happen. So looking for more of things like that, like little sayings, things that I can catch an eye and be like, be mindful. Oh yeah. I was just thinking about the future and like depression. Now I'm going to be mindful of right now. So it, hopefully it just clicks when they see those words and they see those sayings later on in life. And that, that brings us to, you know, the man that you were talking about that he bumped into you into the store and he recognized you. You mentioned that, and I want to know more about what has your community and the people that have been part of mindfulness and the ones that you hope to bring into mindfulness, what feedback and what thoughts have they told you? Just from promoting mindfulness, people are just like on social media mainly because that's like our biggest plug. Um, people are just like, wow, that's cool. I never heard of that. That's interesting. That's catchy. That's awesome. Like everyone's with positive feedback. No one's like, that's dumb. That's silly. You know what I mean? No one's giving me negative feedback. And even if they did, in through one ear, out through the other. Like my, that method for me is huge because I use it all day. And it could be kids. It could be adults. It could be a relationship. It could be somebody in a store in through one ear, out to the other, and just keep moving on. So I'm getting the positive feedback of people are liking it. People are gravitating to it. People are like, that sounds interesting. I know my friends can use that. I know my staff can use that. I know my mom could use that or my son could use that. Here's my card, call me up. I'll work with kids, I'll work with adults, I'll work with elderly, I'll work with whole staff. I need to eventually with the CY Unity group, we're gonna start getting whole groups of people, 10, 20, 40, 50, 80 people at parks. And I want to do mind, free mindfulness for them, free yoga, free, you know, floor exercises, just, just informative things and things that it's like, I'm not worried about charging because I already have a job. I already have a career, but I want to inform. I want to be able that person just to give free knowledge away. And then hopefully they can take that knowledge and give it to somebody else. Kind of that whole giving, giving to others. You're giving back to your community by giving them these resources. And you, you were once a university student. You know how the whole university life is. You know the stress. You've been through all those homeworks, those assignments. And, and although, you know, you know the university lifestyle, even though it's slightly different now, you are a Latino. You are a first generation. You come from an immigrant family. And I want to know, what can you give what message can you give to DACA, to DREAMers, and to overall university students? <clears throat> um, my message is simple because we are always faced with challenges, adversities, you know, um, no, you can't work, or no, you don't have documents, or you don't have papers, or you don't have this, so we're always up against the wall. Um, but we have to just learn to breathe and just take a few steps away from the wall and through breathing techniques for school, for kids, for adults, for college students, breathing techniques, you know, mindful breathing. Um, before I go into a test, before I go into a mu music recital, before I go into a drama play, before I go into a, my job, take a few deep breaths, get yourself centered, get yourself focused, regain your focus because when we're Again, anxious, I'm thinking about what's going to happen later, tomorrow, tonight, when I'm depressed, thinking about earlier in the day when a guy cut me off or somebody yelled at me in the store. We have to erase all that when we go into the classroom. We have to erase all that when we go into the home. We have to erase all that when we go into the work. It's not easy, but it's possible. So being able to practice mindful techniques, whether through me or anybody, just going online and punching up breathing techniques is going to help people. And so that's my message to the world. And, um, and, and DACA and immigrants and Latinos is learn how to breathe, learn how to calm, learn how to get your heart rate lowered just through breathing and practice I am affirmations. 
You know what I mean? Those things are not taught to us as kids. Those things are not taught to us as middle-aged students. Those things are not taught to us as adults. And I'm no longer going to leave that, that component out of somebody's mind. So when I drive, I drive Uber and Lyft and I meet people through there, I'm constantly feeding my mindfulness to them. When I, when I meet people that have like businesses or opportunities, I'm like, here's my card, bring your people to me or I'll go to you. So I'm just constantly promoting the word of mindful, constantly promoting the word of breathing techniques, constantly promoting I am affirmations. That is like my huge, my hugest contribution to people is learn those things. And if you don't know how to do them, I'll teach you for free. <laughs> So we were talking about the whole helping the community, giving them these resources to mindfulness. And we're talking about university students right now. Do you plan on, once mindfulness is out there and get, getting bigger, do you plan on bringing mindfulness into the university world? I, I hope it goes worldwide because people love wine all over the place. Um, again, and it's already UK, Italy, France, Argentina, mindfulness already exists. So I'm trying to capitalize on North America. I'm trying to capitalize California. I'm trying to capitalize Napa, but it's baby steps, you know, Napa and California, the United States, then third world countries, whatever. But my main goal is mindfulness first, I think, is, is mindfulness first, mindfulness second. Um, just because I'm a teacher, uh, I'm not a wine consultant, I'm not a sommelier, I'm not a, you know, wine server pour or maker. So that's not my forte and I don't know much about it but I wanna include it in my methods of teaching if needed, but it doesn't have to be. But mindfulness is my, my message. Mindfulness is my, my bigger agenda on my plate. And I, wanna, I would love to go teach or go do, I don't wanna say a TED talk, but a talk to universities, a talk to elementaries, a talk to fire departments, police departments, go knocking on anybody's door and teach them de-escalating skills, breathing techniques, all the things we've been talking about because we don't know those things. We're not, they're not in our purse, they're not in our bags, they're not in our pockets, they're not in our repertoire because we were never taught it. So I'm trying to make sure that we are taught it even if it's at 15 years old or 25 years old or 85 years old, I wanna make sure somebody knows it before they do not know it and they lose their mind and they lash out or they hurt somebody or themselves because they didn't breathe or take time to just, I am great. I am loving, I am kind, I am passionate. Focus on those things. And you know, that's something that a lot of people are embarrassed to reach out like, oh, I'm getting a panic attack, I'm getting anxiety. Oh no, I have to go to um, get counseling. And that's something that people get embarrassed or about. Or drink, yeah. they wanna smoke, they wanna drink, they want other outlets to not stress and to erase and to forget. But guess what? When you sober up, when you wake up the next day, it's still there. So we have to find other outlets besides drinking, besides partying, besides ignoring it. We have to attend to it. But we have to also have the tools. Because if we don't have the tools, easily we veer off to the left, to the bar. Easily we veer off to the right, to the nightclub. And we're trying to ignore it. And it's not going to go away. Okay, now moving on to the next question. Let's pretend that you are someone else. If you were to give yourself feedback, what would that feedback be? Um, as a kid, like if I was talking to my younger self or adult self? I, I would like to hear both. Both? Um, talking to my younger self, <clears throat> I would really try to, re to tell myself and remind myself that family is first. Friends are second, you know, because I had it the other way around. I was friends first, family second, all the time. Um, wasn't a bad thing, that was my survival skill because my parents were working, my brothers were busy, I was by myself. So I turned to my friends easily. But I think if I were to turn to my parents for certain things, I wouldn't have got those wrong answers. Or I wouldn't have committed possibly that crime or did something dumb or tagged on a wall or whatever. I was being a monkey see, monkey do with my friends. So I tell my son, you know, you are who you hang out with. You know, make good choices. You know, um, you don't have to do what your friends do. You can see it, analyze it, and say, you know what, not for me. I'm good. I'm going to pass. You don't have to do what your friends do. So that's what I would tell my younger self because I was so easily influenced by my friends because those were my brothers and sisters, mainly brothers. Um, and then my older self, I would, I would have told myself to practice mindfulness early, practice breathing techniques, practice I am affirmations because I too was like, I'm short. I don't like my height. I'm never going to grow big. 
I'm skinny. I'm never going to get strong. Like it was always negative comments to myself. Never. I'm great. I'm loving. I'm kind. I'm happy. I'm unique. I'm positive. Never that. But it was always, I'm slow. I'm, I don't throw hard enough. I'm never going to make it to the big leagues. I can't kick hard. I can't shoot a basketball. It was always the negative realm. So I would tell myself to speak positively to myself and to others more than looking for those negative gestures or comments to ourselves. It doesn't do any good to us or a service to us. Wrapping up our questions, why do you think it is important to maintain a positive attitude? We kind of got a glimpse of it, but what benefits and do you think positivity brings along? I just think um, overall stress, um, if we stay positive, if, if we're not focused on negative, if we don't let one negative comment or, or negative look or negative reaction bother us, we can just keep moving along. But every time we let that negative look, negative comment, negative feedback, negative cyberbullying, negative social media post, it affects us. They're like little darts being thrown at you and it's sticking to you. And the more darts you let stick to you, it's going to just start taking a toll on you. So when I was a kid, I remember they used to say a saying like, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. That was like an old like, kid, like when we were bagging on each other or making fun of each other, you're ugly, you're fat, you're slow, you're dumb, you're whatever. Uh, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off me, sticks to you. That was huge. Because as a kid, you're saying that, that means whatever you tell me, I don't care. It's not gonna bother me. It's not gonna process, it's not gonna make me think I'm dumb, I'm ugly, I'm slow. Nope, it just hit me and went back to you. Now you rethink that, maybe you're that. Because when people lash out on other people, it's because they have problems with themselves, first of all. It's not really you. It's themselves first, then you second. But if you let it go right back to that person, throw the energy right back to them, they have to sit and think in that, wow, I just made fun of this person. I just put this person down. I just yelled at this person and they weren't affected by it. Well, let me go try somebody else. And if you ignore it, and let me try somebody else, after two, three times, that person's gonna stop. So if I have that method of I can breathe, and this is what I tell my students. Somebody says, you're dumb. I tell them, I tell them, take a deep breath and tell them it's okay. It's going to be okay. And walk away. So they like, that easy? I go, yeah, practice it. So I tell all 25 of them, I go, you're slow. And they take a deep breath. It's okay. It's going to be okay. And they walk away from me. So those little things like that, go a long way in the future. When somebody comes into my restaurant or somebody comes to my job or my business says, you're dumb, you didn't connect my phone or you didn't do this, you didn't do that. In through your nose, out through your mouth, it's okay. It's gonna be okay. Walk away. Sometimes you can't walk away, but you gotta stay there, but you can still learn how to deal with it if you breathe and just calm and not have to get their energy and lash out as well. That saying, I hadn't heard that saying before. You, you kind of left me like, whoa, I hadn't heard that one before. That was, now, uh, ask your sister, she might know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so, you know. Talking about, talking about siblings, you know, it's like siblings tend to fight a lot. And something that one of my sisters would, would say, it's like sticks and stones make break my bones, but your words will never hurt me. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. So those things, when I look back at those things when they were said as kids, I'm like, those were the things we needed to relish on. Those are the things we needed to focus on because you're teaching a tool to somebody to say, whatever, you tell, whatever somebody tells you, don't take it to heart. Don't take it personal. If it's a comment, if it's something nice and loving, yeah, thank you, I appreciate it, you know, compliment back. But if it's something mean, aggressive, nasty, let it go, walk away and live to talk to another person without stress and anger and, 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 and um, frustration. You know, people can frustrate, especially, our own. I had three older brothers. Yeah, I think you had older sisters, right? Like, you know, yes. same concept. And, and, but they were either picking on me or leaving me alone. So I was like, do I want to go mess with them? Because then they make me cry. Or do I just leave them alone so I don't, they don't make, mess me, make me cry? And that, you know, as a kid, I, was, I had to figure out things fast right away. So that's why I think I kind of matured quick, but then I'm like, I, I go backwards because I'm like, wait, wait, there was a lot of things as a kid that I should have picked up, but I passed them by because I was too busy trying to impress. I was trying to busy, I was too busy trying to be like the other people. I was too busy trying to fit in instead of be myself. 
And that's my major key to people is be yourself. Sergio, thank you so much for being on my show. This conversation is, I am amazed. I am motivated by you. You inspire, you know, you were an example to many that it's possible to be pos positive and to seek for change, to become a better person, even when life gets tough. And you kind of shared your website. Can you share it again and some social media that way more people get? Yeah, for sure. So my website is winefulness.org. Um, and then my IG account is winefulness Napa Valley. W-I-N-E-F-U-L-N-E-S-S -S dot org. And then Winefulness Napa Valley, all one word. That's my uh, Instagram account. I have more information on there. But both of them will, will serve to anybody because if you just click on it and start looking at the quarantine mindfulness or the I am affirmations or the breathing techniques that I've kind of posted on there, you'll keep getting more information that is vital to you. I can't give it to everybody. I wish I can. But if they log in, if they check, if they reach out to me, email me, brown underscore O-N-E-R if you want to get in contact with me, or you can share my information with anybody in your school. I'm an alumni of CSUN. You know, my, my heart is there. <clears throat> um, so anything I can do to always help my alma mater, I would love to go back and speak to the community. It doesn't have to be Latino. It could be anybody. Um, so feel free to invite, ask. I'll jump on a train or a plane and, and go do that for you guys. I would love to, you know, go back to my stomping grounds for sure. Talking about winefulness, you know, what, what better way to let go of negativity than with a, a glass of wine in hand, right? <laughs> Thank you, Sergio. They, they go hand in hand. It, it, there's an etiquette. There's an etiquette to drinking wine, and it's a lost art. And I keep telling people on my website, I say, winefulness, being, drinking wine is a lost art. The etiquette of winefulness is, 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 is gone. I said, if we learn how to bring that back, we can learn how to calm relax be in the present moment even if it's through wine or a glass of water but just be mindful is, is my my main goal i like that thank you so much sergio and you know thank you to everyone that tuned in to my audience um you know don't forget to check out winefulness and remember that positive minds lead to positive lifestyles and there's plenty of negativity in this world and it, it takes it takes us it takes you to to see the world in a better way and in a positive way Thank you so much, Sergio. Good to see you. Great seeing you.